Salt Lake City is about to kick off its Critical Connection Study, in which several solutions for solving the city's historic east-west divide will be evaluated and open to public comment. One of the alternatives that will be discussed is the Rio Grande Plan, but not exactly the version I had originally pitched. Before beginning this study, Salt Lake City commissioned a screening analysis from engineering firm Kimley Horn in order to meet with local stakeholders and determine what the actual impacts and costs would be. The good news is that the professional engineers found that the Rio Grande plan is entirely feasible. The unfortunate news is that the cost estimate they came up with was much higher than many people were expecting, myself included. This is because, besides the headline-grabbing cost estimate, the Kimley Horn analysis doubles the scope and scale of the project to include twice as many railroad crossings as Cameron and I had originally pitched. It also proposes reopening a long closed surface street, moving a heavily trafficked freight interlocking below grade, and relocating the existing North Temple Station to be a block closer to the gateway, while also being below grade. This new, bigger plan would bring substantially more benefits to the residents of Salt Lake City, and would be a huge boost to UTA's future plans to completely grade separate and expedite frontrunner commuter trains. So in this video, let's step through the plans developed for the screening analysis and see what stayed the same, what's new, and what we can suggest for the next iteration. Let's start with the cross-sections. I was pleasantly surprised that the screening analysis included enough width for six tracks in two sections, the same as the original. Building big enough for future needs is critical, since it won't be feasible to go back and add capacity for a very, very long time. The dimensions and designations for the six tracks are different, but for the most part, that doesn't matter. Once the box is built, tracks can be rearranged as needed. In these plans, Union Pacific is given space for three tracks, with one of them being a future expansion for increased capacity. Amtrak is given its own track, and UTA is given two tracks. Our original had Amtrak sharing with Union Pacific for a total of two tracks, which matches existing uses, and UTA having space for four tracks, with two of those going to a future east-west rail line between Tooele and Park City, parallel to Interstate 80. More on that line in a future video. Another difference is the depth. This new proposal shows a box that is 38 and a quarter feet deep, which is five feet deeper than I had expected. This may not sound like a lot, but carry that distance out over two miles, and that adds a lot of extra material that needs to be removed from the train box area, and much more wall area that needs to be constructed. The reason for this increase is this area here, reserved for utility lines, called a utility chase, which is separate from the space taken up by the structural beams. Reading between the lines, it seems like this would be Salt Lake City's preferred route to lay new utility corridors, which would be extremely beneficial to all businesses and residents moving to, or currently living in, downtown. Remember, the Rio Grande plan is so much more than just a transit project. In this case, it's also a revitalization and an expansion of Salt Lake City's utility grid. I think before we move on, it's important to remember what Joe Taylor said at the most recent public event, that this version of the Rio Grande plan is one in which everyone gets everything that they want. Like I said before, Union Pacific does not currently operate a triple track main line through downtown, but this version of the Rio Grande plan gives them the space to do so. I think it's genuinely impressive that, even with everyone's wishlist items thrown in, the Rio Grande plan is still considered to be feasible. Now, obviously, things are bound to get pared down and economized as time goes on, so don't get too excited or too worried about any of the specific items in these plans. Nothing is anywhere close to being finalized yet. There is plenty of time left for discussion. That said, let's start looking at the plan view. The new track profile begins at around 15th South, at the South Salt Lake Frontrunner siding, and where Union Pacific has several yard leads that keep switching operations separate from the mainline traffic. The tracks descend at 1%, which is typical for freight trains, and is the same slope I used in my design. The slope holds constant below the 13th South Viaduct, and up to the bridge below I-15, where it reaches its full depth. This is something that still confuses me, because, in my opinion, the tracks do not need to be at full depth at this point. We're still over a thousand feet away from the first road crossing at 9th South, and I cannot think of any good reason why the tracks would need to be at full depth already and below a structural cap. My original design had the downward slope beginning about two blocks further north than in these plans, or just north of the 13th South Viaduct, which would shorten the project area significantly. Moving on, the screening analysis assumes that the existing bridge over I-15 would need to be replaced to accommodate the full width of the train box. They are right, of course, but I had assumed that this could be done later on, as part of a separate I-15 project. With so much space in the train box reserved for future capacity and expansion, there is no need to rebuild this freeway bridge immediately. 
that a mission alone could reduce the cost estimate of the train box by a few hundred million dollars. Continuing north, we finally get to 900 south, which is where the tracks actually need to level out and the overhead structure begin. This section from 900 south all the way up to the Rio Grande Depot at 400 south follows the public right-of-way exactly, which in itself is a significant achievement. Thanks to the foresight of the original city planners, Salt Lake City's wide streets will be able to fit six mainline railroad tracks and associated retaining walls and supports entirely within the public right-of-way, with minimal exceptions. The amount of land acquisitions and demolitions throughout this project are extremely small for something so huge and complex as this. In fact, no residential structures whatsoever will need to be demolished. Compare that to the I-15 expansion project, which will need to demolish multiple homes and displace several very unfortunate families just to widen an asset that already exists. The roadway design above the train box is somewhat different than my original expectations. While we had shown the street be completely reconstructed, except for a series of ventilation shafts set in a new raised median, the screening analysis plans include a much larger opening for most of the box's length, with only a few sections that are fully enclosed. This follows the pattern set from other train boxes in Los Angeles and Reno. I made a video about my train ride through the Reno train box, and if anything, it is even more applicable now. What is most important about this street design, however, is that the question of ventilation has been essentially retired, as the majority of the train box is now open to the atmosphere. Reaching the Rio Grande Depot, the screening analysis plans show the tracks spreading out to fill the available space behind the depot. Historically, there were six tracks and three island platforms at the Rio Grande Depot, which is what Cameron and I had shown in all of our material. The new plans, lacking an east-west transit line, understandably have only two platforms. The Amtrak platform is shown with some pretty odd dimensions, but this is most likely a placeholder. I made another entire video on the difficulties of choosing a height for this platform, the message being that it's still too early to tell at this point what the right answer will be. Meanwhile, the other platform, for Frontrunner Commuter Rail, takes center stage in this design, being centered under the signature glass canopy. And here I must pause and express my appreciation to the Kimley Horn engineers for including this design element in their plans. Without the proper dressings, underground stations can become little more than cold, shadowy holes in the ground. But with the right treatment, such as an iconic glass roof to bring in sunlight and to show off the facade of the historic train depot above, the station can suddenly feel like the center of the world. If Salt Lake City really is the crossroads of the West, then it is the Rio Grande Depot where those roads will meet. Going north is where things really begin to deviate from the original pitch, and here I reiterate that I do think these changes are all for the better. The only downside is that by continuing north, the Rio Grande plan becomes twice as complicated and twice as expensive as originally pitched, as you will see. Let's handle the spur first. The east-west spur branches off from the main north-south box and curves to the west below two older commercial buildings which are now being used as an event space, called the complex, and an indoor self-storage business. These two buildings would, unfortunately, need to be demolished to make way for the new branch, but this would represent the worst part of the plan's demolition needs. From here, the line continues to head west until reaching the Union Pacific main line, which is itself also lowered into a train box of its own. These two tracks are part of Union Pacific's critically important former Western Pacific transcontinental main line, and they see heavy use by intermodal and other critically important trains from both Southern and Northern California. I had originally feared to tweak this line at all, and limited my meddling to a simple realignment of the curves, assuming the Union Pacific would balk at the very suggestion of modifying one of their major through routes. Instead, it seems like, after discussing the matter with the UP, Kimley Horn's engineers feel otherwise, and sunk this main line down into a structure of its own. This is significant, because while the structure is under construction, some sort of temporary shoe fly route will need to be built in order to keep rail traffic free flowing around the work area. This isn't like the 500 West portion we just discussed, which can be built on its own while trains use the existing tracks. Instead, this portion would be more like Reno, where temporary tracks were laid in city streets in order to give enough space to work crews building the train box. But here, there is another opportunity to save on costs, although this one may not be so popular. Just to the south of the current railroad right-of-way, there is another abandoned railroad right-of-way that is currently being upgraded to a linear park and pedestrian trail called the Folsom Trail. At the moment, it consists of little more than a sidewalk stretched through an unimproved dirt alleyway, though some money is on the way to pay for some landscaping. My suggestion would be to build a new train box in the Folsom Trail corridor, 
while trains continue to use the existing tracks. Then, when the box is done, move all the traffic to the new box and remove all the tracks from the existing main lines on South Temple. This would preclude the use of extensive temporary tracks and service disruptions, and would have the added benefit of moving the Folsom Trail up to South Temple, similar to how the current Nine Line Trail runs parallel to Ninth South where it is closer to commercial destinations and higher density residential buildings. So long as trail users aren't too set on the current route, I don't see any downsides. Meanwhile, back at the main train box, we've reached 100 South, where our original proposal called for the tracks to begin their climb up to ground level. The original goal was to get the front runner tracks tied into the existing tracks before reaching the North Temple Station, a major transfer point between front runner commuter rail and the tracks airport line. The new plan, however, has all six tracks remain below grade all the way to North Temple Street, two blocks further north than the original. This was done in order to link the east-west and north-south Union Pacific main lines below grade. In the plans, this is shown as the lines simply curving together, though in modern track design, an interlocking like this is generally preferred, where the tracks run parallel to each other and interconnect via standard crossovers. Regardless, in the screening analysis plans, once all the tracks are tied in together, the tracks begin to rise at a 1% grade up towards the surface. While good for freight trains, this layout means that UTA's North Temple Commuter Rail Station will need to be not only completely reconstructed, but also moved to the south side of North Temple Street, because UTA's design guidelines for commuter rail don't allow tracks to be built on a 1% grade. Half a percent is the official limit. Now, it is possible for UTA's tracks to remain level on the north side, and then climb up a steeper grade to catch up with the Union Pacific tracks afterwards, since UTA's trains are permitted to climb grades as steep as 2.5%. But there aren't many good reasons to do this. Moving the station platform to the south would put it much closer to downtown and the destinations that people actually want to get to. Since it would be right beside the Gateway Plaza, perhaps some remodeling could be done to incorporate the transit station directly into the shopping area. Some commenters have told me that because moving the station to the south side would place it only a quarter mile from the Rio Grande Depot, that the North Temple Station would become unnecessary and ought to be deleted in order to save on costs. I disagree, since I think the connection to the track's airport line is a critical component of what makes Frontrunner so successful, and retaining a second commuter rail station downtown would help reduce any potential overcrowding at the Rio Grande Depot. While the screening analysis shows the bridge structure remaining as is for now, a future project could remove the bridge entirely, since, with all the tracks moved below grade, there would be nothing left for the bridge to go over. A ground-level North Temple light rail station would be flatter, less exposed to the elements, and, because the train box is so deep, could feature a wider tracks platform with direct connections down to the front-runner tracks, so that nobody would need to cross any active tracks in order to transfer between modes. I know this may seem like a waste of a perfectly good transit station, and in many ways it is, but we shouldn't be afraid of making big investments. Cities, at their best, are like the great cathedrals of Europe, which were built first in wood and then in stone, each project taking generations to complete. Continuous renewal and growth are how cities live and breathe, and we shouldn't get too committed to infrastructure that is decent when we have the chance to build something that is truly great. The Rio Grande Depot itself is a perfect example having replaced this beautiful wooden depot from the 1890s. While it is certainly a quaint and charming structure in its own right, it pales in comparison to the magnificent station building that we have today. Moving further north, the tracks rise up at 1% grade, which in the screening analysis would allow them to reach the zero height just past 500 north, or two blocks farther north than the original plan. This added length allows for new bridges to be easily built at 300 and 400 north, which gives me mixed feelings. I agree it is very good that these crossings would be grade-separated, too. However, because the tracks are transitioning in elevation at both locations, these bridges would need to be raised up higher than their surroundings, making them very similar to the design of the current viaducts on 5th and 6th South, in the sense that they are built in the middle of the road, while the edges remain at ground level to access adjacent properties. This is the type of bridge design I was hoping to avoid, since these create almost as many problems as they solve. Now, there are a few things we can do about this. First, you'll notice I said earlier that the tracks raise to the zero height rather than ground level, because the screening analysis assumes a uniform datum rather than the actual ground level. In reality, the ground up here by 500 north is 10 feet lower than the ground by North Temple Station, meaning that, at a 1% grade, 
the tracks would reach ground level about 1,000 feet sooner than the analysis assumes. This could save costs by shortening the total length of the train box. However, shortening the transition section would necessarily make the bridges at 300 and 400 north even more pronounced, since they would need to rise even higher. By doing the opposite, and keeping the tracks lower for longer, or even just raising at a flatter rate, we could also lower the height of these bridges to the point where splitting lanes wouldn't be necessary. Personally, I dislike the idea of giving up an entire street of our wonderful grid to trains, especially one so close to downtown. Even though this section is a transition, my suggestion is to keep the same box design from the blocks farther south, complete with the road still on top. Then, instead of having bridges over the tracks at 300 and 400 north, you would instead have complete intersections, with ramps leading up to the top of the box on either side. This design could continue all the way up to 500 north, and so add another reopened connection to the plan's long list of benefits. As properties adjacent to 500 west redevelop, they could be assisted or incentivized to tie in with the new, higher street profile, effectively raising the entire city grid. While that may sound insane, I remind you that the street immediately east, 400 west, is an average of 15 feet higher than the current 500 west, making that grade change hardly noticeable over the span of a block. The west side would require longer ramps, but when all is said and done, we would have a single, simple, unified street grid once more. One that hasn't existed along this corridor since the tracks originally arrived in 1869. As you can see, this northern end is practically another Rio Grande Plan train box all on its own. It easily doubles the scope and scale of the original proposal, which is why I was so resistant for years to adding it in. My thinking at the time was that it would make an excellent phase two of a project, but that it was too much to add into just one pitch. However, it seems like Salt Lake City disagrees with me. It's their plan now, and they've added it in, and I have nothing but respect. We know from UDOT and UTA's long-term plans that at some point, all of UTA's grade crossings for the Frontrunner commuter rail line will need to be grade separated. Frontrunner cannot be made into a fully reliable alternative to I-15 while it crosses local streets at grade. Simply put, Billions of dollars have been spent over the last 60 years to grade separate the freeway, but essentially nothing has been spent on the railroad tracks. Of course it is going to be expensive to play catch-up, but not as expensive as continuing to rip out and widen our freeways over and over again. Addressing these crossings is not just a neighborhood issue or even a capital city issue. It's a statewide issue and will benefit everyone who uses or relies on public transit in the state of Utah. You shouldn't need to check the news every time you head to the train station just to be sure that the trains are still running. We need this high-priority route into and through downtown, because if we can't make our transit reliable and convenient, then commuters and residents will pick a different mode that is. And one last thing. One other important point about the removal of the North Temple Station is that 200 North Street, which has been closed for decades and which is currently blocked by the tracks and station platform, could be reopened. Think about that. A street that is currently severed at the east-west divide could be reopened to all types of traffic, as though it had never been closed. This is the kind of healing the real grand plan promises, not just addressing a barrier or minimizing an obstacle, or even providing an alternative route, such as a pedestrian bridge. The real grand plan eliminates barriers completely. It solves a problem to the point where it won't ever need to be discussed again. It closes the case on so many grade crossings that are a continual source of anxiety, separation, danger, and delays for so many Salt Lake City residents. Leaving these crossings in place is like leaving the proverbial axe wedge in the trunk of the tree. The city that continues to grow up around these crossings will be weak and plagued with disasters and will never be able to reach its full potential. Combined, these eight crossings have over 500 activation events per day and with UTA set to double the frequency of commuter trains by the end of the decade, that number will climb to at least 800 activation events every single day. This is not sustainable. In fact, it is no exaggeration to say it is a disaster in the waiting. The average length of the average Union Pacific freight train is now well over a mile and growing. What happens when one of these trains suffers a derailment in downtown and blocks every single crossing while rescuers repair the train? What happens when firefighters or emergency responders are blocked by a stalled train waiting for a replacement locomotive to arrive? How many kids will continue to climb up through the stopped trains 
because the pedestrian bridge takes too much time to climb up and down, or is simply too far out of the direct path. We can do better. We must do better. And there will never be a more convenient time to make these changes than right now. If you'd like to support this plan, or some iteration of it, please pay attention to the city's upcoming Critical Connections study. There will be multiple rounds of community comments and feedback spread out over the coming year. Let your city officials know what you think. Would you like something about the plan changed? Make a comment. Is there something that I or Kim Lee Horn missed? Make it known. What matters is that you get involved and take a stand for your community. This is one issue where, if we work together, we really can shape the future of our city. I'm Christian Lenhart. Thank you for watching.